Welcome to today's program at the Commonwealth Club of California, which is the nation's oldest and largest public affairs forum. Every year we present more than 450 forums on topics ranging across politics, culture, society, and the economy. My name's Andrew Dudley and I'm the chair of the People and Nature Forum, which focuses on the relationship between people and nature. It is a delight to see so many faces in the audience today, and I thank you for taking the time to attend this in-person event at the club. For those of you attending this program virtually, I extend a warm welcome and invite you to return to an in-person event as soon as possible. Should you wish to ask a question, please write it down on one of the question cards, which you'll find on the, the seats next to you. Uh, and if you're online, you can uh, submit a question in the sidebar of the YouTube screen, uh, which we'll hopefully pick up. It is a distinct pleasure to introduce Jeff Goodell, New York Times best-selling author of seven books, including The Water Will Come. This evening, he's here to speak with us about his latest book, The Heat Will Kill You First, Life and Death on a Scorched Planet. Now let's please give a warm welcome to Jeff Goodell, please. <laughs> Jeff, firstly, congratulations on uh, the release of your book. I believe it's in the New York Times bestseller list. It is. It, it is. Uh, it is as much of a surprise to me as anyone, but um, I'm really grateful that it's kind of um, connecting with audience, with readers right now. Fantastic. And as you say, it's not often that a climate-related book hits the bestseller list. Yeah, it's not a natural. Uh, you know, the, um, uh, climate is a difficult subject for people, even no matter how you feel about it. And so it's very gratifying to see it on the list. Yeah. So what's been the reception to the book so far? Well, you know, uh, I'm kind of in a way the last to know because, you know, I only hear what people tell me. And, um, but it's been very, very good. I mean, reviews have been great. Uh, you know, I did not expect it to get as wide of a readership as it has. Of course, it's helped that it came out during the midst of this um, global heat wave that m makes a lot of people wonder, you know, what is going on and look for um, uh, some explanation about this and some thoughtful consideration about what it means and what to do about it. So obviously in that sense, I've gotten really lucky. Um, but I also think that these kinds of moments are really important because they open up windows for conversation and to talk about things that normally people don't talk about that much. So before we discuss your book, could you tell us a little bit about you, where you're from and you know, <laughs> where you grew up and uh, how you became a journalist and what led you to focus on climate change? Well, I'm from here. Uh, I was, um, I, and I'm feeling these waves of nostalgia that I just flew in this afternoon. Um, I was born in Palo Alto Hospital, the old Palo Alto Hospital, for those of you who know the distinction. Um, and, and I grew up in Sunnyvale. Uh, and uh, my mom worked at Apple Computer in the early days. I worked there for a little while. Uh, had no idea what I was, you know, my father was a landscape contractor. They did Candlestick Park and um, various parks uh, in Redwood City and along the South Bay. They did part of 280. Um, uh, but I had no idea what I was gonna do with my life. Uh, I went to Berkeley, um, was an English major, had vague ideas about becoming a you know, a novelist, you know, my hero was John Steinbeck. Um, and um, long story short, went to New York and um, fell into journalism. I had never considered journalism. I always considered that I would be writing fiction, but turned out that I had a knack for it, even though I didn't know anything about it. Um, I liked going out and meeting people. I liked um, the deadline, the adrenaline rush of deadlines. Um, and I started covering, um, you know, crime in New York City, politics in New York City, that kind of thing. But I never gave energy or climate any thought whatsoever until um, in the year 2000, uh, actually early 2001, just after George W. Um, was elected, his first term as president, the New York Times called me up and said, um, with the Bush energy, Bush Cheney energy plan, we think coal is going to make a comeback and we'd like you to go to West Virginia and write about it. And um, I remember the phone call very clearly with my editor and I had this little light bulb in my head that went off like, Cole, what are you talking about? I thought coal was something that happened in Charles Dickens novels. I had no idea that we burned coal in America 
<laughs> much less the consequences of it. And at that time, it generated half of our electricity. And as all of you probably know, there's no coal in California. Um, so I had never seen it. I didn't even know what it was, except what I've read in books about it, 19th century novels. But then I went there and I saw these black rocks and I'm like, really, this is how we generate electricity? By burning the rocks? Isn't there like a better way to do it? You know, I grew up here in Silicon Valley and believed in progress and do we really know no better way than to blow up mountains and burn black rocks? And, and that really was, um, you know, I had an inter I interviewed Al Gore like 15 years ago and he said, everybody who cares about climate change has an oh shit moment. And for me, that was my oh moment. Um, I really realized the consequences of where we get electricity, uh, how we get electricity, the political power. I ended up writing a um, cover story for the New York Times Magazine based on that trip, and that turned into my first book. And I've not looked back since. And I've just sort of come to understand that climate and energy and this transformation we're going through is the great story of our time. And I feel incredibly privileged to cover it. And maybe that leads into the next question. So, so what motivated you to write the book? What, I'm sorry, what? What motivated you to write this book? This book? Yeah. So this book was very clear. Um, I had been covering climate and energy for 10 or 15 years. Um, I, of course, knew about heat. I mean, you can't write about climate change without thinking about global warming. And global warming, of course, is heat. And I, I obviously understood it in some kind of intellectual way. But I happened to be in Phoenix on a day um, much like today in Phoenix, and it was 115 degrees, and uh, I was staying downtown, and I had to walk 12 blocks to a meeting, and by the time I got to those 12 blocks, my heart was pounding, I was feeling a little dizzy, and I was like, oh my God, if I had to go another 12 blocks, I'm not sure that I would make it. Mm -hmm. And it made me understand that I had no idea what the sort of actual physical real life consequences of heat was, even though in some sense, I wrote about it all the time. And I thought about that. And then I realized that I was talking to a friend that night and that I didn't even know what heat was. I could tell you what temperature was, but if you would have asked me what heat was, I couldn't have explained it. So the combination of the fact that I felt the immediate like risk and power of heat physically at that moment, and then I, that I didn't <clears throat> understand what heat was made me think, hmm, this is an interesting idea for a book because I bet a lot of other people don't understand this either. Mm -hmm. So billions of people are experiencing unprecedented heat. Do you feel the term global warming doesn't speak to the gravity of the situation? Yeah, I do, I do feel that very clearly. I mean, you know, global warming sounds like better beach weather. It sounds like who, who doesn't want it a little bit warmer weather? We can go to the beach, go to hang out in Santa Cruz, you know. Um, uh, I think it really miss... Um, misrepresents what we're facing, the scope and scale and, uh, and urgency of it. Um, you know, there are other phrases like climate crisis and climate emergency, but, you know, it's not just the phrase global warming, it's everything about the way we talk about temperature and the way we talk about it in the context of climate change. You know, the, the, you know, the um, IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change talks about you know, the risks of 1.5 C of warming or 2 C of warming, which translates into three or four Fahrenheit of warming. And even that, I mean, that doesn't sound scary to anybody. It doesn't give you any sense of the consequences. Who can tell the difference between a 75 degree day and a 79 degree day? I mean, mm -hmm. it means nothing. And so we really don't grasp what these temperature changes mean and that we don't grasp, you know, how these what sound like small changes in temperature drive, first of all, <clears throat> excuse me, all these other larger planetary scale changes that we're talking about, but also how they change these extreme heat events that we're experiencing here and now, you know, and like we experienced in the Pacific Northwest in 2021, where you had 121 degrees in British Columbia, which was, you know, as likely as snow in the Sahara. Mm -hmm. But we're moving into this, these, this this climate of extremes now because of these small shifts in temperature. And I don't think people get that at all. I think global warming climate change is still seen as a faraway distant event that'll happen someday to some people who are unfortunate enough to not live with air conditioning, you know, um, and that's not what we're facing. You mentioned throughout the book, the term, the Goldilocks zone. What, what is that? Goldilocks zone is a phrase that, um, 
planetary scientists use when they're looking for the possibility of life on other planets. Um, they're looking for the presence of liquid water as a, as a basic indicator of the possible conditions for life. If it's too cold, it's ice. If it's too hot, the water is vaporized and gone. So they're looking for liquid water, and they call that the Goldilocks zone, not too hot, not too cold. And I use it in my book to describe the kind of, the, the kind of climate that we've, we meaning all humans and more broadly all life on Earth, have, have evolved to deal with. You know, we're very good at dealing with temperature fluctuations within a certain range. And we can function very well within that. And we're built, we're finely tuned machines that are built and evolved to deal with that. But we're beginning to move out of that Goldilocks zone. And we're beginning to move into temperature ranges that are beyond what we have evolved to deal with. And that is a very um, frightening scenario. Mm -hmm. Can you take us through um, atmospheric dynamics and, and how we get to a heat wave and maybe touch upon what happened in the Northwest Pacific as well? Well, heat waves are basically, you know, stagnant dome. People talk about heat domes and things. They're stagnant high pressure zones where the air um, just sort of sinks down and, and compresses and gets warmer and warmer and warmer. The heat is radiating up off the land, warming the, the air. And, um, you know, these, Obviously, we've had heat waves for a very long time. I mean, that's nothing. It's not like we've just invented heat waves in the last decade or so. But what's happening is, um, first of all, because of the planet generally getting warmer, these heat waves are getting like you know, warmer also. They're building on top of these warmer temperatures. But we're also changing the atmospheric dynamics. And we are changing the temperature gradient between the poles and the equator. Those are having effects on the jet stream, there's a lot of, um, a lot of these heat domes that we have now have this, these sort of horseshoe pattern or wiggly jet streams that kind of trap this heat in these, under these domes in these certain areas for longer periods of time. So, you know, sort of two things are happening. One is that we're generally getting warmer and that's causing the extremes to get higher and higher because you're building on a higher base. But we're also having impacts on the atmospheric dynamics that is causing these, um, these heat waves to stay in place longer and form in places where they hadn't formed before. And that's, you know, that's basically what happened in the Pacific Northwest. No one expected uh, you know, this high pressure zone to settle over the Pacific Northwest. That was not in anybody's climate models. Mm -hmm. In the book, uh, the, you talk about the tragic events surrounding the young family for Mariposa. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> before you take us through that, could you tell us what the what the significance of wet bulb temperature is, please, and how that impacted the family? Well, wet, there, you know, there's various ways of of measuring temperature, right? I mean, there's just the the, the air temperature. Um, there's the humidity, there's the uh, heat index, which is an attempt to put air temperature and humidity together. You know, the, the, and then there's wet bulb temperature, wet bulb globe temperature, there's, which I'll explain in a second. But what all these different measurements are trying to get at is what the heat means to us as, as a human being, right, to a person. Um, because whether it's wet heat or dry heat has a big difference on how our body functions. 100 degrees, if it's now, in the Mojave is very different from 100 degrees in the Philippines. The more moisture that's in the air, the more difficult it is for our body, for the sweat to evaporate, right? Because there's more water vapor already in the air. So you're, the efficiency of our only cooling mechanism, which is sweat, doesn't work as well. So not all temperatures are created equal. There's all these other things. So wet bulb temperature, was developed by the military that tries to consider not just heat and humidity, but also things like um, sunlight radiation, how much direct sunlight you're getting, wind, things like that, the clothing you're wearing. It tries, it's a sophisticated um, mechanism that tries to be sort of more precise about what that heat means to you and to, to your body. Okay, and then what happened to the family when they went out for this walk? So the first chapter of my book is about a, a family, a story that many of you may know um, because it was pretty big news here in the Bay Area. Um, uh, in the summer of 2021, um, a family 
moved from, they had moved out of the Bay Area during the pandemic. They wanted to start a new life, um, get away from the kind of rat race. Uh, he was an engineer at Snapchat. His name was Jonathan Garish. Uh, his wife, Ellen Chung, um, also worked in the Bay Area. They had a one-year-old child. They decided to move to Mariposa near the, uh, you know, just outside Yosemite. Uh, they built, they bought a house there and they were going to start a new life there, working kind of remotely and things like a lot of people did. And they, um, they were very fit people. Um, I mean, very fit might be a little bit of an exaggeration for, for Richard. He was in good shape, but yeah, I wouldn't, maybe he wasn't very fit, but he was in good shape, very healthy, no problems. They had hiked a lot. They were experienced outdoors people. Um, and they decided to go for a hike one day, a seven mile hike, um, literally like the trailhead was a mile from their front door. They wanted to go explore the Merced River. They were still exploring the area where they had moved. They'd been warned about heat, it was, a, it was forecast to be about 105 degrees, 106 degrees that day. Um, he had talked with his brother about it the night before. His brother said, be careful, it's gonna be hot. He said, I know, we're starting early. They left at 7.30 in the morning, hiked down two and a half miles, three miles down to the Merced River, fooled around down there. No one knows exactly what they did. They took some selfies and were, they were found on their phones later. And then at around 11.30, they started the hike back to their truck to where they had parked their truck. And to get to their truck, they had to go about two and a half miles up a very steep southern exposure uh, slope where there was no shade, partly because there had been a wildfire there a couple of years earlier and burned whatever trees were there. They went up this steep switchback. Um, they weren't carrying enough water. And no one knows the precise uh, order of events that happened, but the upshot is um, their family and friends realized the next morning that they hadn't come back from this hike. Search parties went out and they found uh, the bodies, The Jonathan and Ellen and their, and their one-year-old daughter and their dog all dead on the trail. And it seemed at first, no one could understand what had happened. You know, they thought maybe uh, they had hit a old uh, gold mine or something, you know, were poisoned by carbon monoxide. They wondered if it was some kind of a suicide thing, which was immediately kind of dismissed, but that, you know, they had to explore all the options. Then it finally, became clear to investigators that what had happened is that they had all died of heat stroke um, uh, on, on this climb out. And the reason that I wrote about it in the book is um, to explain and to show and to demonstrate in this sad and tragic way that um, it's not just the sort of obviously vulnerable people, people who are elderly, who have heart problems, people who are working out, outdoors on you know hot highways in Texas in the middle of the heat. It's ordinary people going on a hike on what seems like just a warm day. And it really, to me, underscored um, how little we know about the risks of heat and how little we appreciate that. And that includes me. I mean, in that same chapter, I talk about a hike that I took in Nicaragua a few years before that, um, where I came close to, a, 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 you know, a, a heat stroke on my body uh, was sweating uncontrollably. I was hallucinating, losing, uh, getting dizzy. And only because the people I was with kind of understood what was happening mm -hmm. that, you know, I was okay. But this can happen to anybody. And I really wanted to underscore that. There, there was a subsequent investigation. Uh, what, what should the family have done in that situation? And of course, for anyone in the audience, if they find themselves in a similar situation, what's the recommendation? Well, I mean, the, you know, the, in, in one way, the, the, um, what you do if you're in a situation where your body is overheating is you have to get out of the heat. I mean, you have to cool off. There's no other solution. Um, if you go to the hospital, they will put you, you know, if your body temperature is high enough, they'll put you in a tub of ice or in some cases, as they did in the Pacific Northwest, a body bag full of ice. But I mean, you have to get your body temperature down as quickly as possible. So, you know, the problem is if you're on a halfway up, a mile and a half up a slope like they were, and it was a mile and a half down and a mile and a half up, and then you realize that you're overheating, there's nowhere to go, mm -hmm. right? And so that's a really tragic situation. So, you know, what would have saved them would have been 
to realize when they st first got going and they started to get hot and realized, oh, this is a long, hot climb. This is dangerous. We should turn around and go back and go back to the shade by the river and mm -hmm. wait until the evening and things cool off, right? Um, the only thing that would save them is not getting into that situation, right? And so if you're in a situation where you are overheating, you have to cool off. So that means getting into shade, getting cool, uh, you know, compresses or whatever you have that's cool. You know, the, the places that cool you off fastest, ironically, in, in a way, are palms of your hand, balls of your feet, and your forehead. And those are the places you want to put cold compresses as quickly as possible. But the best way to deal with, you know, the get, not being on the road to heat stroke is not to get on the road to heat stroke yeah. by staying out of the heat. So compared to humans, how does heat affect plants? Well, same way. I mean, you know, every living thing has a thermal zone that it is happy with. And whether it's a corn or wheat or a butterfly or me or you or an elephant or a giraffe or a whale, we all have these zones that we can function in and different animals have different adaptation mechanisms, different ways to cool off. You know, humans have this sweat mechanism that is, we're the only creature that really has this kind of mechanism. I mean, horses can sweat and they have a different kind of sweat gland that as many of everybody who've been around horses know they kind of lather and things, but it's not the same thing and it doesn't work as well. We have this really highly sophisticated sweat mechanism, but you know, other animals, you know, have other mechanisms, you know. Um, uh, um, kangaroos spit up and throw up on their forearms and then w wipe it on their faces and on their bodies to cool to get to, to create moisture so that it'll evaporate. Um, there's all kinds of different mechanisms. You know, elephants flap their ears as the giant fans and send a lot of blood out to their ears. For the, in the, for the same reason, to, to try to cool off. Um, you know, other animals, you know, bay, hippos go into the ponds, right, to cool off in that way. They use environmental things. Everybody has a mechanism, but, you know, plants are the same thing. They, they can do things like evapotranspiration, opening the, you know, the pores to essentially sweat to try to cool off. But if that's a very dangerous strategy for them, because if they run out of water, then they're in big trouble. They become dehydrated and vulnerable, just like we do. Um, so all living things are kind of, it's, it, heat is very democratic. It, it affects everything and everybody. And the only thing you can do is get out of the heat or move, you know, I mean, migrate. And creatures that can migrate, like humans, they can either walk into the shade or move to a cooler place are much better off than redwood trees or something like that, that are, you know, a redwood tree is not going to stroll, you know, a couple thousand feet up the mountain to cool off, right? So what's been the impact of failed crops and food shortages on recent history? You mean heat related? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's huge. I mean, um, for example, I spent a lot of time in this reporting this book in the Rio Grande Valley in Texas, which is one of the most agriculturally productive regions of the country. And there's a lot of crops that are grown there of all different types that um, are at their thermal limits, right? And so anything, anything any hotter and, you know, they will die. And it's the same way that we will die. They will overheat. And, you know, you... Um, Corn is particularly vulnerable right now in many places in the United States where it's grown is it are at its thermal limits. You look at you know extremely hot places uh, in Africa where there's been massive crop failures um, due to extreme heat and in some cases come and often combined with droughts. I mean it's a very big problem um, because you know a lot of people think oh well. You know, if it gets too hot for corn or wheat in Texas or too hot for corn in Iowa, which it almost is, we can just grow it in Minnesota. It'll be, what's a, what's a big deal? Uh, it is a very big deal because you, you know, the productivity and everything of these crops are dependent on, upon the soil, the light condition, water. There's a lot of things that go into making Iowa, for example, 
very productive for corn. And another misconception is that we will simply engineer our way out of it, that we will simply figure out how to pull the gene for heat out and put one that runs a little bit hotter in there, right? And just that we can just use genetic engineering to make plants more heat tolerant. And that's, I explored that in some depth in the book and it's just not true because heat is not like blue eyes. It's not a trait that is carried in one gene. It's deeply woven throughout the whole genetic um, makeup of a plant just as it is with us. And so there are plants that are more thermally tolerant. And there are ways that we can do things better, and, but, but it's not simple. In, in the chapter, Cheap Cold Air, you explore the invention of the air conditioner. Could you take us through a little bit about how that came about and, and also what was the influence on migration in America? Well, you know, I, I think of air conditioning as one of the great American inventions up there with, you know, personal computer and the Big Mac. Well, yeah, I don't know if I <laughs> quite call it a great invention, but you know what I mean? <clears throat> uh, iconic American invention. Um, and you know, it started in the 19th century um, uh, with attempts to, they, they, you know, discovered that, you know, as you compress and decompress gas, it transfers heat. And, you know, an air conditioner is basically a reverse of refrigeration. It's the same, the same process. Um, and it was initially used for um, hospitals in, in, the, in the South where they were trying to cool things off for malaria patients and others who were suffering in the heat. Um, but it quickly became commercialized um, in you know, the 40s and 50s. And I write about um, a Texas entrepreneur named Harold Goodman who um, was sort of a lost soul, good for nothing gambler, 25 years old, his parents had no idea where they were worried about whether he was just gonna end up just a, you know, a bookie somewhere and uh, got into um, air conditioning and ended up 35 years later a billionaire. Um, and you know, the, the mass commercialization of air conditioning, you know, basically allowed the settlement of where I live now, Texas and Florida and the whole South I mean, obviously people lived there before, and I would argue maybe in a better way uh, without air conditioning, but you know, you would not have this massive migration to the Sun Belt uh, that we've had over the last 30 or 40 years, which has had huge political implications in the states, you know, the whole Southern strategy that Nixon you know, first understood and has been a really important part of national politics ever since. Um, you know, you wouldn't have Ron DeSantis running around right now. Um, for better or for worse, um, <clears throat> without you know a Florida that is cooled off by air conditioning, you know, it's it's transformed our world in a very powerful way, and um, there's certainly benefits from it, um, uh, but it's not magic. It doesn't it doesn't make heat vanish. It just transfers it from one space to another. Um, it is not a cure-all, it is not a techno fix. There are billions of people on the planet who don't have air conditioning and for all intents and purposes never will. Um, it doesn't do anything for outdoor workers, uh, the agricultural workers that I wrote about who died in the fields, the guys I see working on the Texas highways in the middle of summer, the people in construction, all the people outside, postal workers, everybody outside, they're not air conditioned. Um, you know, they're not, we're not air conditioning the oceans. We're not air conditioning, mm -hmm. you know, the f agricultural fields where we grow our food. Um, and we're also, finally air conditioning makes us dependent upon the power grid and gives us a false sense of security, right? I mean, uh, when I was in Phoenix reporting this book, one of the infrastructure experts there talked about the inevitability of what he called a heat Katrina, which is on a hot day, you know, the electricity grid is strained to its maximum because everybody's cranking up their air conditioning, which makes it much more likely that you're going to have a power failure. And a massive power failure in a place like Vegas or LA uh, or Phoenix on a really hot day, you're going, he, he described to me, you know, and other studies have shown thousands if not tens of thousands of people dying because we don't, we build places now, houses, buildings, offices, without any kind of sort of natural ventilation windows are sealed, they become convection ovens if there's no AC. So, you know, air conditioning 
gives us this sort of sort of Damocles hanging over us. And there's ways of dealing with this, but it's, but it's not a sort of simple fail-safe solution. You were saying in the book that eventually they had air conditioning in the White House. Was it true that Lyndon B. Johnson used to crank up the AC and then sleep under an electric blanket yeah. in the summer? <laughs> I know, right? It's, it's all about leading to the climate. Right. And I also love that, that, that um, Faulkner, who obviously was a Southern writer and whose books are kind of drenched in heat and <clears throat> all about the sort of sultry, quiet violence of heat, hated air conditioning, just hated it. He, would, he thought it was the invention of the devil and wouldn't have it in his house. And then... The day he died, the next day, his wife had air conditioning put installed <laughs> in the house. <laughs> I found it fascinating when you discuss, uh, you know, uh, climate culture preparedness of cities, and you use two cities, Paris and Marseille, as examples of how the different architecture and design of these cities uh, were able to defend one against heat wave, but not one against the other. So Paris mm -hmm. in 2003. Can you take us through and describe what you meant by that? Well, I mean, Paris is a really interesting city to think about um, with climate change broadly and um, heat more particularly uh, because they had a, um, first of all, they're, nothing about the city is built for heat in any way. Um, as one Parisian that I talked to for the book, you know, described it there, heat stupid um, because they've just like, in fact, I was heat stupid. I grew up in the Bay Area. I grew up in Sunnyvale. And... I never had to think about heat. It was always like this like lovely Mediterranean climate like, like it is today, right? And so I knew nothing about heat risks. And Paris has been that, like that for centuries. But one of the things that's happening is that we're getting these extreme heat waves that are beginning to hit places like Paris. And in 2003, there was a particularly brutal one um, that killed 15,000 people. And um, one of the problems in Paris is the way that the city is built. Um, not only is it I mean, every city is, is a, what they call an urban heat island because they uh, are 10 to 15 degrees hotter than the surrounding area because of all the asphalt and concrete and steel that absorbs the heat and then radiates it back and causes them to be hotter. But Paris, as any of you know who's been there, have these lovely tin roofs on the tops of all the buildings, which were an 18th century when they reimagined Texas in the 18th century, these were a kind of hallmark of that kind of architectural design. And now they are, um, you know, they could make these buildings like ovens because they absorb the heat and they're not insulated underneath. However, um, Paris is also, uh, so, so they're trying to modernize Paris and they're doing a, the mayor's doing a lot of really great, interesting things, trying to green the city, understands these risks of, of heat and other climate related issues. They're banning cars from the inner city and things. But there's this problem of what to do with these tin roofs because they're on virtually all the buildings on the center of the city. Uh, there's a big movement to um, uh, have them marked by UNESCO as a World Heritage uh, sites because they are so emblematic of the city. And no, you know, there's a huge coalition of people in Paris who say you can't change them, you can't do anything because Paris won't be Paris without these tin roofs. But then the reality is, is that these are also turning all these buildings into ovens and cooking people underneath them. And so it's a perfect example of the maladaptation of cities to our rapidly changing world. And it's a real big problem in Paris because um, you know, there are ideas about what we could do, like putting green roofs on top, uh, building kind of patios and things on wooden patios that have planters and things above them, uh, taking the roofs off, putting something else on there that is you know, so, sort of less of a heat magnet. But it's a real tension in, in, in the city, and it's emblematic of the kind of tension that many cities are going to feel as they become aware, as people become more and more aware of how poorly they designed they really are for the mm -hmm. coming climate. And how did that contrast with the way Marseille was designed, like in the architecture and the, the way they laid out the streets to allow cool air to, to blow through? So, yeah, so a city like Marseille and many other cities that were designed more intelligently 
thinking about how the breezes can be caught um, coming off the sea, how that will, will be channeled through the city, how they'll be cooled, leaving spaces between buildings for cooling. Um, you, know, you see that in, in Texas also, just in, you know, I called it, in my book, I called um, air conditioning the technology of forgetting. Um, because we used to know how to build cities and orient things with the sun, orient them so that they catch cooling breezes. In Texas, there's these things called dog, dog trot houses where they have a broad passageway between the two sides of the house to let the breeze go through. Trees were planted so there was shade around. There was, you know, obviously people lived in hot places. In the Middle East, they were able to make ice in the 16th century by using wind tunnels that funneled the, the breezes under, under, over underground pools of water that cooled it and recycled it and recycled it. So they made air conditioning without having to have these mechanical machines that are plugged into coal plants, right? Um, but we've forgotten how to do all that and we just build buildings and plug these either wall air conditioners in or these central systems and think that, that we've solved the climate problem. Mm -hmm. It was quite surprising that back in 22, there was a heat wave that hit London and the chief of the London Fire Brigade said it was the busiest day they'd had since the Blitz yeah. in World War II, which is quite shocking. Yeah, well, you know, the link between heat and fire is very straightforward. Right? Yeah. How well prepared do you think a city like San Francisco is for a, for a heat dome? Not very. Um, you know, I mean, obviously it's on the bay. It's got, it's got cool, I mean, you know, what is the... Mark Twain's great phrase, the coolest... Summer, the co winter he ever spent was summer in San Francisco. I think it was the yeah. coldest... Win su summer. Yeah, no, win whatever it was. <laughs> what? Anyone know? <laughs> coldest winter was a summer in San Francisco? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, so, yeah. so I mean, I, and I used to, you know, I mean, I, I know that very well, but, but in a way that that, you know, leaves San Franciscans unprepared for how to deal with heat, right? I don't know, I haven't lived in San Francisco for a couple of decades, but... You know, I don't think a lot of people have air conditioning here, right? A lot of people, a lot of the buildings are not designed thinking about how to deal. Like you look at old, like the Victorian houses here. I'm not a San Francisco architecture expert, so I, <laughs> I, might, I might be wrong. But when you look at Victorian houses in Texas, they have all kinds of sophisticated ventilation systems with transoms that open and, and uh, wind chambers and things to carry the heat out. They were designed to deal with heat. And I, I somehow doubt that the Victorian houses here that make up a lot of the city were designed for heat in that way. Oh. Sorry? Right, you have fog, right. <laughs> but, you know, you will, you will also have heat. And, you know, we had, you had 121 degrees in British Columbia, uh, you know, two years ago. And there's no reason you couldn't have 125 degrees in San Francisco. Um, that's, that's the world we're moving into. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one the, the biggest idea, or one of the biggest ideas I'm trying to communicate in this book is that the climate that we grew up in, all of us, is no longer, and we are not ever going back to that climate. We've changed things fundamentally in a very profound way. We're moving into this new climate era in which not only is it hotter, but the rules are changing very fast. And just because it's never been 125 degrees in San Francisco before does not mean that it can't be 125 degrees in San Francisco at some point in the very near future. And this fundamental shift in that we are not going back to, there's not a new normal or a, you know, there's not this idea. Like when I grew up here in the 60s and 70s, it was smoggy. I used to be in Palo Alto and Sunnyvale and not be able to see the hills across the bay because it was this yellow band of smog, right? And then catalytic converters came along, industrial scrubbers on industrial facilities. The chemicals that caused smog were removed from the, from the air. And the air cleared up and it was better. And now you can see across the bay and you, it's a very different environment if any of you who lived here in the 60s and 70s will remember. But CO2 is not like that. It's not like we stop or reduce CO2, the air immediately, the CO2 falls out of the air in the same kind of way. CO2 is essentially permanent. Thousands and thousands of years, it stays up there. And so until we either 
like let it naturally dissipate over thousands of years or build machines that suck carbon out of the air, which is a whole other story that, you know, is beginning, people are beginning to do, but it, the scale of it is so vast that for all intents and purposes, it's, it's, it's nothing that's going to have any kind of major impact for, for many decades. We are stuck with a much hotter climate and a much hotter planet. So we are not going back. Mm -hmm. We are moving into a new climate era. And just out of curiosity, by a show of hands, how many people here have an air conditioning unit at home? <laughs> air, air conditioner. So That's hardly, hardly anyone. Yeah. So what's the advice then if we were to get hit by a heat dome in San Francisco? Do we open our windows? What would Jump in the bay. The what? Jump, Jump in the in bay. The bay. <laughs> <laughs> but what is the guidelines? I read in the book that you should close your windows, your blinds open them at night, but close them in the day. Right, right. Don't eat uh, big meals. Is that, is yeah, that a bit of a the thing? eating big meals things, is, you know, I mean, that's marginal. I mean, the main thing is, you know, getting, I mean, the, it's staying cool, right? Mm -hmm. So going to lower floors, basement areas, wherever it is, if you know a place that has air conditioning, a library, something like that. Uh, but also knowing your vulnerability. I mean, some people are far more vulnerable than other people. Um, as I said, older people, anyone who has any kind of um, heart issue, circulatory issues are, are much more vulnerable if you're on certain kinds of drugs, diuretics, beta blockers, things like that. Um, uh, pregnant women, young children, all those categories of people are, are, are um, much, more, much more vulnerable. And so checking in on others and helping others who you who you know might be vulnerable. Um, you know, taking cooling baths and showers really is helpful. You know, whatever you need to do to keep your body temperature down mm -hmm. uh, is, what, is what you need to do. And again, just to clarify, the risk is if you do have an air conditioning unit, it creates a false sense of security if the grid was to crash and the power right. was to go down and you'd be... Right, so I mean, this, I live through this in Texas all the time. Uh, you know, every time there's a heat wave, well, which is basically all <laughs> summer in Texas, um, you know, there's n every day there's a you know warning more. This is the highest usage the grid has ever had. You know, the, the maximum capacity, and there's concern about you know they ask you to turn back your thermostat. You know, turn it to 74 or something instead of 68 or whatever people keep it at, and not to do your laundry during the middle of the day and all that. To, you know, all the things that you've I know California's had rolling blackouts and things. All those standard things. Um, but it's, you know, it's a, it's a real risk and um, uh, we're not prepared for that. I mean, there's a lot of things we, you know, you can do in the sense of um, backup battery power, you know, people who have Teslas and, you know, I mean, using your car as a backup battery and all, and all that kind of thing. And in the long term future, we're moving in that direction with the grid and with backup stuff. But for now, we're still really dependent on the grid. And, and that makes these kinds of moments really dangerous. So using the example of hurricanes, you suggest that heat waves should be named and ranked to better prepare people. I wouldn't say I suggested. I would say that I like the idea of exploring that idea. Because I think that one of the problems with heat, the reason nobody understands it is because you can't see it. It's invisible, right? You look out the window, you can't tell if it's 70 degrees or 170 degrees out the window. Um, and so it's unlike a hurricane. You look out the window and, the wind is, and there's a hurricane coming, you can tell if it's a 30 mile an hour wind or a 130 mile an hour wind, it's obvious. If the trees are broken in half, it's a, it's a high wind, right? It's just, there's lots of visual indicators. Heat is not that way. So we, and we, so we don't intuitively understand it in in, in a good way. There's all this language stuff I talked about with global warming. You know, also the way we talk about heat, you know, I worked, I've worked at Rolling Stone for a long time. Every summer we have a hot list, you know, the hot movies, hot books, hot TV shows, things like that. You know, it, heat is seen in much, you, know, you go to a, a, a party and you see somebody that is good looking, you call him or her hot, right? Uh, Mark Zuckerberg started Facebook um, rating girls in his Harvard dorm as hot or not, right? Um, the Miami basketball team is called the Miami Heat. And it's not because they're afraid of, of heat strokes, right? They think that's, that's seen as a good thing. So there's a lot, and we in the media are really bad at 
um, messaging about it also, and communicating about it also. If you watch your TV, local TV is probably better than, than most, but in much of America on a hot day, the weathercasters will show people playing in fountains and um, hanging out at the beach or water skiing or something. And they, there's nothing visually that communicates the risk. So naming heat waves is a way of helping to message and to say this is dangerous. Same with the idea of ranking heat waves. This is a category one, category two, category three, category four. We don't do that. We need to do more sophisticated messaging. And naming is a controversial, but I think a possibly effective way of getting people's attention. Um, and at the very least, we should be experimenting with it uh, and see how well it works. It's a little more complicated than storms because storms are rated on just on wind speed. Basically, it's very simple. Heat is different. Um, you know, like I said earlier, 100 degrees in the Mojave Desert is very different than 100 degrees in the Philippines or in Miami or something. And so you have to make the ranking particular to the place. It's not a kind of generic wind speed mm -hmm. thing, but we can do a lot better in talking about the risk of heat. So you speak about humans having kind of this Goldilocks zone, but the same is for mosquitoes and ticks. So, you know, their boundaries or their, where they can travel to is expanding. How is that impacting humanity, as it were? Well, that's a very big and important thing. And, you know, as everyone knows, mosquitoes are very mobile. Um, that's what makes them so wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, you know, as the temperatures change, as regions warm up, they move into their Goldilocks zone very quickly. And um, mosquitoes and ticks are just two examples of um, uh, animals that carry what are called vector-borne diseases, which are you know animals that, that carry these diseases. And um, mosquitoes carry things like dengue fever, Zika, uh, malaria, uh, things that we don't really particularly uh, want to have around us that are very dangerous. And as the temperature changes, these diseases are then are moving with the mosquitoes into new places. Um, the textbook example of this is um, Mexico City, uh, you know, one of the largest cities in the world. Never had mosquitoes um, before. Um, now, just because the temperature is generally getting a couple degrees hotter because of this moving up, this temperature range that I've talked about, mosquitoes are beginning to move in now and with them are coming dengue and zika not malaria yet it's carried by a different kind of mosquito but it, and the city is completely unprepared nobody has screens nobody has bug nets anything like that in places like malaria these changes in temperature have huge consequences because suddenly areas that were too not not warm enough for the particular kind of mosquito that carries malaria uh, are now warm enough and so you have you know, malaria already kills 400,000 people or so in, in Africa a year, mostly children. You're getting more and more people in these warmer areas at risk now. We just, in the US, just three weeks ago, saw the first resurgence of malaria in the, along the Gulf Coast. So the, these, you know, um, animals that are moving just like we would move to cooler and, and to more temperate climates to their Goldilocks zone, are coming and with them are coming the pathogens and microbes and things that go with them. The other classic example that a lot of people know is Lyme disease moving up from Long Island now all the way up almost to Canada because of the warming. So what do you, one of your guys that you interviewed said that we're one tick away from catastrophe. One tick away from catastrophe? catastrophe. Was that in the book? I, I should have read that. <laughs> I don't remember that one tick away from the catastrophe. Well, maybe line. I made that one off. Yeah, that, <laughs> might be, that, that might have been left over from some other book. I don't know. No. So on Sunday, the uh, UK Guardian featured an article which, uh, which featured uh, the Sebastian Perez. It was titled Racism at the Heart of uh, Failure to Tackle Deadly Heat Waves. Can you tell us more about that story that you were featured in and the story about Sebastian? Yeah, well, Sebastian Perez is a, was a... Guatemalan um, who um, uh, came across the border in Texas and went up to he 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 in Guatemala he couldn't find work um, he married um, 
He got married. They, he wanted to start a family and build a house with his wife and have children, but he couldn't find work and make any money to do that. So he decided, like many other Central Americans, to come to the U.S. to find work, and he wanted to save money and then go back to Guatemala and build a house. He had relatives who were working in a nursery in Oregon, so he crossed over the border, went up to Oregon, got a job working in a nursery there, was by all accounts an incredibly hard worker, um, had been there only about four months, um, was educated about heat. He lived in Guatemala, after all. Um, um, and, you know, even the, the night before he died, his mother, he, was, he would call his mom every day, and his mother had heard that it was going to be warm, that there was a heat wave in, in Oregon coming, and told him to be careful, and he said, basically, mom, don't worry, I got it. And, um, he went to work in the fields and, you know, again, no one knows exactly what happened, but, you know, he uh, was a migrant worker, as many of the farm workers are up there, who have no federal protection whatsoever. Um, they no legal protection from heat risk or anything like that. There's no requirements for any breaks or anything like that. And, um, you know, he was basically faced with the situation of it's hot, uh, I need a break, but I also know that if I take a break and sit in the shade, I'm going to get fired. And so he didn't want to get fired because he loved his wife and he wanted to save money and build a house for her. So he um, made the, the, the risk, the gamble that he'd be okay and he kept working. And at the end of the day, his co-workers found him dead, laying in the field. Um, and he had water. It wasn't that he didn't have water. What he didn't have was a break. And what he didn't have was any laws or anybody who really cared about his fate. And that's the problem with um, thinking about heat, is that it's, it's in the Guardian piece I talked about, I talked about it about the racial aspects of it. And the people who are most vulnerable are the people who don't have a voice, who don't vote, who have no political coalition, who are seen in our culture as expendable. Sebastian Perez died, well, it's too bad, but there's you know thousands of Sebastian Perez's behind him, the people who run the nursery, not to, you know, I'm sure they're good people and all that, but it doesn't matter to them, right? The, the people like Sebastian Perez are not seen as humans. They're seen as just field hands. And, and so, um, you know, I, I talk about this because it really plays up, I call heat predatory, and it really is predatory on people who are vulnerable, home unsheltered people, outdoor workers, you know, um, people who don't have the money or the means or the power to f seek refuge and find protection. And, you know, one of the things that I worry about most, we talk about adaptation and, you know, that always comes up like air conditioning and all that. But, you know, one of the adaptations I worry about most is that we'll just simply adapt to the fact that 30,000 people die every summer from heat stroke and you know, X number of agricultural workers and X number of FedEx drivers and X number of construction workers. And that's too bad, but it's summers are hot now. And just like we adapted to COVID, we adapted to a large number of deaths of COVID and it became like, okay, well, that's our world now. I really do worry about that with um, how we're going to adapt to climate change. Mm -hmm. So that really fits into the next question is, well, you know, what is next for humanity, you know, beyond the Goldilocks zone? Is there any good news? Uh, you mentioned <laughs> drinking Zinvadel from Alaska, maybe in the future. Uh, well, you know, I think, there's a, I think there's a huge amount of good news. I think, because I think that we're at a major inflection point in our culture and in our society where everything we do is up for grabs now. Um, in that, in this, everything I do, in the sense that where we gener how we generate electricity, how we build houses, what kind of food we eat, all of this kind of stuff, we're going to have to change, whether we like it or not. It's not an option of whether we're going to change it. We are going to have to change it because of the CO2 we've already put in the atmosphere and, and the trajectory that our um, planet is on because of what we've done so far. 
We have a real choice, though, about what we want to do about that. And this is why I'm, you know, not a doomer at all. In fact, I'm kind of a weird, perverse optimist because I really do think that we have a chance if we think about it and pay attention and understand the scope and scale of what we're dealing with to build a much better world, you know? Um, you know, as much as I love Sunnyvale, where I grew up, I don't drive through there and think, this place is perfect. You know, there's nothing we could have done better. And these strip malls are fabulous, you know? Um, <laughs> w there's a lot of things that we can do to build a better world and do things better in a fairer, more just kind of way. And this moment, because so much is at stake, if we engage, if we get smart, if we get educated, if we get politically active, I think we can really make things better. And just as right now people are listening and reading a book like mine because it's hot and because they realize, oh my God, this is, the sky is broken, mommy, what do we do? That larger kind of sense that we're at a big transition point, so people are beginning to listen. I'm always asked like, why are you not an alcoholic? You've been writing about climate change for 20 years. Why are you not an alcoholic living in your basement, scrawling messages on the wall in crayon, you know? And, and it's because I meet so many inspiring people who are doing incredible things, thinking differently about how to do everything from, you know, build houses, getting people to vote, thinking about food. There's just so much energy and, and, and possibility right now that, um, uh, that gives me my kind of perverse optimism. And you also, you also mentioned, thank you. Yeah. You also mentioned that the world is decarbonizing faster than anyone anticipated a decade ago. So that, that sounds like good news. Well, I wouldn't say, I, I, no, I think that's not quite right. I didn't say it's decarbonizing faster. I said that the economics are changing faster okay. than, than they were a decade ago. So a decade ago, or you know, when you talk to people about how we get our energy, it was always that solar and renewables were too expensive. You know, yeah, we'd like to do it, but you know, we need cheap power because cheap power is how we you know, it drives development. We need to help poorer people get richer, and we need cheap energy to do that. And so we have to burn coal and fossil fuels as a poor sort of. I mean, I've been in debates with coal executives, and they make it a moral case. I'm doing morally a good thing by building coal plants because it's the cheapest power, and I want to lift people out of poverty. Well, that argument is completely gone now. If anything, it's reversed. Now, virtually everywhere on the planet, building renewable power is way cheaper than building fossil fuel power. And so the only, there's no longer any economic argument about this. The people who need subsidies now are the fossil fuel people who need subsidies to keep this, you know, this old fossil fuel train rolling a few more decades. But that's changed the conversation in a big way. And, it, and so there's a big victory for you know, renewable power. Uh, but, and you would think it would be a big victory in the climate fight, but it, the problem is now in the climate fight, it's moved to sort of the cultural battlefield. And now it's like about being woke and, and, or, or not. And it's about you know, belief. Do you believe scientists, what they're saying? Do you believe in climate change? They become this sort of like weird, like religion. And the idea of science and evidence, which even a decade ago, were not really challenged. Now, people don't believe what scientists are saying. They just think that all these graphs and charts and numbers are all just like invented because they're all being paid off by George Soros or something, you know? <laughs> and it's kind of wacky and scary. Mm -hmm. So just moving to one of our uh, questions from the audience. Uh, so this question is, you say the best solution for heat stroke is not getting into a dangerous situation. How must we prevent the worsening climate emergency given the UN Secretary General has said that we're entering the era of global boiling? Well, I mean, the, the way that we have to deal with, you know, uh, heat stroke in the broadest sense is by re, you know, reducing CO2 emissions as quickly as possible because that's how we're going to keep the temperature on Earth cooler, right? If we, the, the Earth, the atmosphere is going to keep getting hotter as long as we keep emitting CO2. And then as soon as we get to net zero CO2, however you want to calculate that, that's when the temperature will stabilize, but we're not going back, right? So. In a certain way, you say, what's the best way to deal with heat stroke? It's like, stop burning fossil fuels, mm -hmm. right? Um, 
but I was taking it in a more personal way. And so the best way to deal with it is to like not go out and like run a marathon on a 120 degree day. But um, what, what, what he's talking about with the global boiling point has sparked a lot of controversy online and other places, you know, because of course the ocean, look out at the bay, it's not boiling, right? I mean, we know that. I mean, even Biscayne Bay in, outside of Miami, which had been over 100 degrees, which is basically hot tub weather, uh, hot tub temperatures, uh, is not physically actually boiling. But, you know, he's frustrated and he's, and he's using this as anyone knows in a kind of uh, awful poetic way, right? In the sense that we're crossing over, he's reacting to the same problems about this phrase global warming that I was talking about earlier, that it just sounds like better beach weather. You know, global boiling is all has its own problems, but it's also metaphoric, right? And so, you know, I, I don't know how to police the, his language, but I understand what he's talking about. Another question is, why do you live in Texas? <laughs> <laughs> that is a very good question, <laughs> especially now that I've been back to the Bay Area for like six hours. Mm -hmm. um, I live in Texas because I fell in love. Um, you know, I've, <laughs> yeah, you can love people in Texas. Um, uh, uh, no, the woman I married um, has a job in Texas and um, she couldn't move. And so if I wanted to be with her, I needed to be in Texas. And I wanted to be with her. And, and, and so, and it's also turned out, I didn't know this at the time, but a really good place to write a book about eat from. You know? <laughs> I mean, I was pretty brilliant in like choosing a place to, if I was gonna center myself one place. Um, but it also just underscores, you know, how complicated these sort of questions of where you live really are. You know, it's not simply about, often it's about being close to family. Sometimes it's about cheap real estate. Sometimes it's about jobs. You know, climate is just one factor in all of this, but increasingly it's going to become a bigger and bigger factor. And, you know, in Texas now, summer, you have to live a vampire life. You know, you stay inside during the day. If you're gonna go for walks or runs, you get up at 4.30 or 5 a.m., you go then. You know, you stay inside in your air-conditioned bubble during the day. You look out the window at the poor people working and you feel bad for them and you hope they don't die. But, you know, you, d you know, the, 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 I can't tell you like the change in the rhythms of a city like Austin in, in the summer, the outdoor cafes, are either empty or they have these enormous fans with um, air blown at them. So you feel like you're getting like drenched in a like misty shower that just turns into this sort of moppy sweat thing on these hot days. Uh, you can't go for hikes, you know, um, maybe, if, you know, it, it just changes the rhythm in a very, very profound way. And uh, I don't like it, but I love my wife. Okay, good answer. <laughs> so for our audience here today, what would you like the key takeaway to be? Um, well, I think that this question about, this idea about moving into a new climate era that I think is really profound and important to grasp. But I, I think that the big takeaway is connected with that is, is that um, we need to get, you personally, you, and I need to get smarter about what we're doing here, about and how to handle these risks and how to think about this in our lives and how to you know, think about solutions in the sense of, I hate that word solutions because it sounds like it's, it's too, like just like a plaster cast or something. But I mean, in the sense of you know, how you need to understand the risks of heat and how you need to get educated about it and how you need to get educated about where you live and about how you vote and what that, why that matters and to understand the scope and scale of what's really happening here. I mean, that's what, part of the reason why I went to Antarctica and wrote about Antarctica in my book and things is this is not just some like weird weather thing. This is like a change in the operating system of the planet, if you will. And I think grasping the scale of what we're dealing with and then 
getting educated and getting smart about it and getting active and making it part of your life in how you think about everything, where you invest, where you live, how you talk to your neighbors, I mean, how you think about your personal health. It is, I mean, the reason that I have been writing about it for 20 years and gonna write about it for, God help me, another 20 years, is it's the great story of our time. It is the story of our time of which all the other stories are subsets of. Uh, including democracy in a way. And I think grasping that scale is, is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Well, Jeff, in closing, I wish to thank you for writing this very important book uh, and for sharing your time with us this evening and helping us maintain our tradition of 120 years of enlightened conversation at the Commonwealth Club. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.